also this week is our first audition day. So I thought we could start uh, our live stream off, maybe talking about some audition tips, tricks, things uh, that I think about, experiences that I've had, some reflections uh, that maybe will be helpful or useful to some of you who are entering into that season. That's coming up for many of you, I'm sure. Um, and uh, so yeah, our first audition day is on Saturday. I'm looking forward to hearing a bunch of really great young trombonists who are coming to, uh, to audition. And you know, I used to put a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of pressure on myself about auditions. And um, it really was never, never a great thing because I would, I would overthink about it. I would um, overanalyze everything I played, you know, and I remember my Juilliard audition, I got so down on myself. I didn't think I got in. I was really negative about it. And um, you just have to remember that it's just like one little snapshot of many snapshots in your life about your musicianship. And um, you just put your best foot forward. And to me, the most important thing to do at an audition is to make music. You know, I make sure to have, make sure we have a live rhythm section the auditions for us happen here in this room. So we have uh, a rhythm, live rhythm section so that you can just play the music, you know? And to me, that's the most important part. I'd rather hear your true musicianship, your, your um, whatever you're working on. I wanna hear like, you think I want you to play this way or that way, but um, you know, the main things that we're looking for, that I'm looking for at least in an audition is like, does this person enjoy music? Do they know what jazz music sounds like? I know that seems like a stupid thing to say, but you'd be surprised how many times you might hear some people that are not actually that interested in studying jazz music. Just playing, playing music, man. Just, just come in and just play some tunes and your musicianship will shine through. You know, you're not gonna cram. You know, if it's today and my audition is on Saturday, you know, you just wanna set up a positive, good vibe for, for the audition day rather than trying to like cram because you're not going to change. Your musicianship is not going to evolve magically from Tuesday to Saturday. Andres mentioned he's dealing with some throat tension. When I was trying to like get strong, I never really did get strong. I got ton, a ton of throat tension from just like, you know, trying to lift or whatever and then like gets really tense and not good vibes. Trying to be as relaxed as possible is my, <clears throat> excuse me, my approach. To playing the trombone, you know, I don't, I don't think tension is good anywhere. Throat, breathing, chest, stomach, all of that stuff, I think is important to make sure that you're staying as relaxed as possible. I heard Steve Davis talk about like a baby's breath, you know, you want to just to be deep and in the stomach and then like relaxed, playing without tension. That's hard though. It's hard to keep it up for a long time, especially when it's loud or long. Charlie Vernon suggests sucking air from the mouth as opposed to the corners. Oh yeah, like taking a full breath. Yeah, I'm with you there. Oh, that's good advice, I think. I'm trying to stay relaxed, man. The trombone is uh, too physical of an instrument to try to overcome, you know? It's gonna get you every time. I've heard a lot of stories about, you know, Dizzy Gillespie said, saying something similar, that the, the trumpet was gonna win every time. You know, the trombone isn't too far behind. You've talked previously about this type of thing when it comes to learning jazz by osmosis, which doesn't really work out super well. When did you realize that you had to put extra work in order to improve your sound and playing? Sometime in college, undergrad, you know, I think as a high school student, you know, there's kind of like these mechanisms where like, if you're pretty good in your high school band, like you kind of get like funneled this way and then you start doing all state and this and that, and then you get some success. And so you kind of just, you know, you kind of get pushed along in this way. Once you get to college, you realize like, oh, that you can't just coast, <laughs> you know, you actually have to work on stuff. My freshman year, it was like an ear training. It was a theory class, I think. It was a theory or ear training class. And, and then he started playing like chords with extensions, trying to get us to identify the extensions of the chords. And I was like, oh, there's extensions? What's that? And then they're like, oh, you alter the extensions? Oh, there's modes? I, like I exploded, you know, in that moment. And, 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 but I've always been a person that knew that I had to put in time and work. Like it never came that naturally to me. Andy says, best people to listen to and to learn jazz vocabulary on trombone. I kind of go, quote unquote, to what I call like the middle of the music and then work outwards. And to me, the middle of the music is like 1950s, like J.J. Johnson, Curtis Fuller, Slide Hampton, learning that language from the source 
And then we want to kind of go backwards and learn the history. And so we learn people like Lawrence Brown, Vic Dinkinson, go back further, go to Kid Ori, go to Dickie Wells, go all the way back. And then you want to kind of come forward and see what else is happening after, you know, I mean, Slide kept playing, you know, but then there's people like obviously Steve Turay and Andre Hayward and Wycliffe Gordon and Steve Davis and just a whole bunch of people that are kind of forward from that, you know, what I think of as like the middle. Obviously, there's more people. I left them out. But Robin Eubanks, of course, so many, so many great trombonists. But to me, it's like you learn the fundamentals of the language from transcribing JJ, you know, and Curtis. And uh, and then maybe branching out a little bit f from trombone. Um, I think uh, bird is really hard to play on trombone. And so I've changed my approach to try to learn like some Bud Powell stuff first. So I tend to try to learn Bud Powell, a few Bud Powell things before I go to a uh, like a confirmation or Donnelly, just because it's like a little less notey, you know, to me. And it's a little more trombone friendly, the piano lines. Realizing doodle is not the actual way to sound it out. Tada promotes a more open vocal approach. I say tada or da ga 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 or do 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 Steve Turay was really big about talking about vowel sounds, and so that's kind of been burned into my brain. And so I kind of think about vowel sounds ah in the middle register, o in the low register, e in the upper register. So it's you know da ga da ga do go do go do go do go do go do go da ga 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 da but yeah, always D and G for me. I can't, the ooh thing, the doodle ooh thing is not clean for me. But I haven't really like taken any lessons trying to get better at doodle. Because I kind of like the cleanliness of the double tongue or whatever you want to call it. Toddle, 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 little, 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 little. Yeah, the ul thing is just like too far in the back of my mouth. It's like feels like all back here. Like I want it in the front. I want it. I want it forward, front. I don't want it to be like back here. But that's just me. Everybody has their own way of playing. I'm not saying my way is the right way. <clears throat> I don't think that there's one way to be successful here. Uh, let's see. Gers, recommendation for maybe a month without playing. So you took a month off, and now you're trying to get back into playing. Doing long tones into the upper register. To, you have to get some more. Um, just time, face time, right, to get the chops happening again. I do long tones, lip bends, um, stealing again from J.J. Johnson, the whisper tones, and then stealing a little bit from, like, the Caruso method where you kind of keep the horn on your face, you know. You might take a nice relaxed approach, um, and you kind of breathe through your nose and play the long tones but it's it's important to keep the horn on the face in the same place it starts to develop the the musculature a little bit so maybe i'll do like a snake kind of long tone where we'll go up a half step down a half step and then up a whole step down a whole step up a minor third down a minor third and do it on f and then b flat and then d and then f above the staff um just trying to sit one we talked about this already but staying relaxed of course as relaxed as you possibly can and um keeping that tension out of your neck, you know, and then breathing through your nose, to, just to keep it set. I never breathe through my nose when I'm playing, except for when I'm doing that one particular exercise. You have a private lesson student who is losing motivation in lessons. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> What's your next step? It depends how old they are. I mean, I'm dealing with college students, so it's a little bit different than when I was teaching high school, middle school, elementary school students, you know. With elementary school and middle school students, I always tried to find some music that they wanted to play, you know, because sometimes the music that we were playing was not really what they were interested in. So I find a way to get trombone involved. And I remember doing a whole bunch of stuff with like Ableton and Coldplay songs and transcribing Kanye West and doing some tunes like that and like integrating technology, getting them to record themselves, seeing how the trombone was like applicable to like real music. Like I kind of just stopped all the let's play long tones and flexibility it's like that stuff is great but really at that age it's just about the horn on the face so that's what we would do we just get the horn on the face and play whatever any different kind of music you know but for my students uh, i mean they're not always motivated let's be you know everyone goes up and down i'm not always motivated so i try to kind of sprinkle little um there's little kind of check marks in throughout the semester so there's always like a little goal a small goal you know not a huge huge thing but there's always these little kind of goals throughout the semester we have um 
like so performances basically so you know i make extra time book a room have them get rhythm sections come in play their tunes or play tunes of their choice like a little 20 minute presentation of their stuff get feedback from their peers you know a classic studio class you know but we don't do it every week because i think that gets a little burned out if you do it every week um so we do two maybe three a semester um so we have those in the evenings and then every week we have a trombone departmental but the jazz guys play maybe two times a semester so they get like a little performance there like during the week and then you know which i try to do something fun as much as possible you know my first year here we went to atw this year we're going to itf we made a record last year with our jazz trombone ensemble you know so those little kind of i don't know what you want to call them rewards or little projects things like that have been helpful in keeping people motivated the jazz having our jazz trombone day you know seeing how many people have like tuned into those things and check them out and listen and bringing in guest artists, all that stuff. Like if the students aren't doing anything, I'll just be like, you know, we don't need to do that. I don't need to take the hundreds of hours that it takes to do all that stuff. You know, we don't have to. Kevin says motivation boost, play something simple as nicely as possible. You know, that's really hard for some people. That's something that I have trouble getting people to do sometimes is just play something simple. Or just play something pretty. That's usually what I say. Play, just play something pretty. What's your assignment for next week? Just play me something pretty. Like, what do you mean? Like, I don't know. Play me a ballad. Bring me an etude. I want to hear you play something pretty. Because when you're prioritizing goals for a day, how do you structure how long something will take before going to the next thing? It depends how many things you need to get actually get done that day. So having a good amount, a good goal of like, well, I know that I can accomplish something in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And then, and like what things in your practice do you need to do daily? And what things do you need to go deep on? Like, for example, like some things, like if you're trying to get them for me, like into the muscle memory or the, uh, or the back of your brain, so you're not thinking about the execution of them, is to do them frequently over a long period of time, as opposed to like going deep on one thing for a super long amount of time but if you're doing like a transcription or something you need to go deep enough for an hour that you get something out of it because if you just do it for 10 minutes you're not going to get anything out of it so organizing your practice sessions in a way where you can do certain types of practice in a in a, in a row you know knowing how this is why you have to keep a practice journal because you got to know how long you can practice for before it's not useful anymore so if it's it was I discovered, you know, 90 minutes to two hours was the max I could really be effective for. That's probably even more than I really could be effective for. But that's another story. But I would say like 90 minutes to two hours max. So if I had three 30 minute chunks or something, but then in like in a day, like if you just kind of compress different tasks into short periods of time, like, all right, I'm not going to do anything else but my email for like an hour. Um, and just kind of do it that way and kind of go as much as you can in a short amount of time for how long something takes like to go to the next thing it's like most of the time you don't have unlimited time so you got to just stop yourself and go on to the next thing what was the biggest learning lesson you gave to a student recently to improve on something that they needed to improve on you know for me i find out that usually this it's the same is there's a consistent theme throughout working with a student kind of whatever their strengths are and their weaknesses are kind of continue to be those things kind of throughout the relationship that you have with them you know i get a master's student for example you know we're here for four semesters which is roughly 18 months you know it's not that long of a time you know so to, to expect that something's going to like be life-changing in that amount of time it's like if you work really hard you can make huge strides but it's still only 18 months so it's not going to be your whole development but trying to find different ways to address that same theme is challenging um and so the lesson that I've learned about trying to help students is that I need to be insistent and clear and try to come up with things that they can help them to see things from another angle. No matter how much I say to do something, it still has to become their idea. You know, if I demand things, it's not going to. It's not always going to be um, productive. Some people need that more than others, but it's a balance, you know. So what I'm learning, the biggest thing is like that balance of who to push, how hard to push them, and um, how much is too much, you know. Like when do you back off? Um, and then not everybody has the self-motivation to keep going, and like these different little projects are helpful. 
What are some goals you've been working on in the last few weeks to boost your musicianship? My goal is to just care less and play more. Just play more music. And that's why I've been trying to have students in and just play, force myself to play more. It's been hard to play, you know. And when I say play, I don't mean just like have horn on face. I mean to play music in a way that's public facing because it's different when you get play in a rehearsal than a than a gig, you know, and even if it's just like a live stream or something, at least, you know, there's people out there. Like, I know there's people out there and you guys are listening and I'm not going to just like mess around and screw around. I'm going to try to be attentive to you all that are here. And same thing when you're playing for a live stream. It's like it's not the quite the same as a concert, but like it's something and there's people there and you want to sound good. You know, and so uh, putting myself in a situation to make myself do it, because otherwise I am somebody that will just get um, wrapped up in uh, things, you know, wrapped up in all kinds of things. Tasks, you know, just like, oh, do this, do this, do this. So uh, Taylor says, what's on my reading list? I just read, um, it's called The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. <laughs> Probably comes as a surprise based on the other books that I've been uh, recommending on on this series on Armando yeah man I just try to be real with my students as much as I can about what's going on about how you know like uh, one of them was here they said what have you been transcribing and I said oh nothing <laughs> you know like I don't try to try to just you know prop myself up I'm just human just like everybody else you know can't be in all places at once and you can't be all things to all people it's hard man you gotta just be real that's what i try probably not everyone believes me that i am but i try my best I try my best to be to be honest but i'm not motivated and be like you know you can do it this way and just they all think i'm not mean enough probably I'm not direct enough but i think you got to have that if you don't have the intrinsic motivation man like you're not going to last after school like you're not going to keep getting better so i feel like that's my job is to like one like instill curiosity you shine some light on things you know like what about this what about this like have you thought about it this way and then to um what did i say and sh shine a light and and just kind of like guide them along you know like I'd inspire them to get that in, in intrinsic motivation because I can't I can't help you if you don't want to help yourself after this is funny okay you're in prison for five years can only bring one of the following your favorite album and something to play it on that's fair a trombone but no mouthpiece and a trombone mouthpiece I guess my favorite record because you can't play the trombone without the mouthpiece and I hate buzzing so just my favorite record sounds sounds good Taylor wants to know if I have transcribed a lot of bass solos have I transcribed a lot of bass solos? No. Have I transcribed some bass lines? Yes. Um, and I tend to learn tunes from the bass. So I learn harmony from transcribing the bass. You know, like what's the bass player playing? He's playing arpeggios, he's playing scales, whatever. You know, that helps me to learn the harmony of a tune. Uh, okay, and I'll wrap up with this one. Matt asked me if I have a process for learning bebop heads in all 12 keys. Um, yeah, so my general process is obviously to learn it in the original key first. And so learn it in the original key, internalize it. Don't memorize it, internalize it. Uh, and for me, internalizing means playing without thinking, you know, internalizing. Okay, I know the tune, I know how it goes, I can sing it, etc. And then we gotta break down like, what is this? How do I take it to another key? Some people are really good at just like, find another starting pitch and find it. But I find that bebop tunes have a little bit more, too, too much information to only do it by ear. I need a combination of my ears and also some details. So uh, meaning like, okay, what tune are we talking about? If we're talking about like blues, uh, blues for Alice. Right? I'm gonna be like, all right, it starts on one. And so I, and I try to give every phrase some way to remember what it is and I take it phrase by phrase and uh, that's not the answer you probably wanted to hear but it really is like take it one phrase at a time if it if you can do one bar or two let's say two bars then in two weeks you can have a 32 bar tune in 12 in 12 keys but if you take two bars per day in 12 keys that's 16 days technically but it takes a long time that's one of those things like Taylor was asking about how long to spend on something it's like okay 
don't spend seven hours trying to take a bebop head through all 12 keys. It's not going to happen in one day. It's just not. You have to give yourself time. So you got to take two bars through a few keys. And then you take two bars through 12 keys. All right, good. I got those. Now I do two plus the next phrase. Then I do three or four bars plus the next phrase. And then soon you have eight bars. And once you get eight bars through 12 keys, it really opens things up. And once you've done it, you just have to realize, pick something short. Pick blues for Alice. Pick something sh like a blues that's only 12 bars so you can have success because it sucks. It sucks to take things through 12 keys unless you're a person that really loves doing that. Like, but it's so important to develop your ear, to develop fluency on your instrument, to understand the keys and the language. It's so important, but you have to give yourself the time to do it. It takes a long time, and it takes it sucks. It's it's hard hard practice. This is not like casual practice. You need focus if you're going to take things through the keys. You know, you can't just do it. So it gets faster. That's the good news. It gets easier. That's also the good news. But the first time is hard. You know, I said, I try to be real when I'm teaching. When I started trying to take things through the keys, it's hard. And that's okay. But it's because it's only hard because it's unfamiliar. It's actually very easy once you do it. You know, you start to hear the shapes in different keys. You know how to move things around. Uh, and it gets easier. Uh, he says, how do you maintain an active social media presence? That's never been my thing, but I know the value of it. Want to get better with it. The short answer is that um, I have people that help me. You know, I have... Um, some people on my team. It doesn't hurt that I also have a, you know, I run a record label media company and we do social media as a service for artists. So like I'm always kind of engaged and thinking about content and planning. So basically plan it all out and then you just execute it on a week to week basis. Sometimes there's like a daily inspiration to do something, but mostly no, mostly it's, it's on my spreadsheet. There's the post. I've already written the description. I already know what I'm going to say. I already have the video edited, and then I just post it. Um, that's the easiest way to keep up with social media. Bob commented, persistence overcomes resistance. That is the truth. For taking things through 12 keys or for trying to get up on social media more regularly, and, you know, you got to have a, a reason to. And why are you doing it? Not just to do it, you know. What's the reason? You know, that's how I think about it. I think about it as part of my business. Part of the time it's like investing in my business, my art is uh, spent doing social media. Here we are, you know? So it's the long game, you know? Sometimes there's only one person here, two people here for the live stream. Everybody can't come every week, you know? But I, sh you know, you show up and um, engage with people and slowly but surely the word gets out and people start to share and all these kind of things. And you never know. Persistence, my friend. All right, I gotta run. I'll see you all real soon. Yes, the, I saw a question about the concert will be streamed. Yes, it will be streamed tonight. Uh, big band recital from UNT. It's on the UNT um, College of Music website. You can see all the streams of our concerts here. So just Google it. The, the address will be way too long. So UNT College of Music, Nick Finzer recital, uh, and today's date, and you'll find it. Uh, easier than I could send you a, a URL. So uh, happy practicing. I'll catch you guys all later.